Hello everyone, my name is Katya and I'm the producer at Strelka Institute. Welcome everybody who is watching us on YouTube, Facebook and Vontakte. I would like to welcome Lukas Likovchan, the speaker of our public program Strelka 2020 Life. Lukas is a philosopher, a theorist and a researcher and the lecturer at the terraforming program at Strelka Institute. Lukas is the author of Introduction to Comparative Planetology, an essay which describes different methods of perception of our planet. Lukas will speak today on the mat matters of visual culture of imagining our planet Earth. There will be a Q&A session after the lecture, so please do not hesitate to post your questions on YouTube, Facebook or Vkontakte, and I will pass them to Lukas. The lecture will be in English with a simultaneous translation into Russian. For the Russian translation, please open Stroka Institute page on Vkontakte and Russian Facebook. English version is available on our YouTube and English Facebook. So have a great time watching and I shall pass the word to Lukas. Thanks so much, Katya, for a wonderful introduction. And thanks so much, Stroka, also for uh, giving me an opportunity to have this kind of broadcasted version of the talk. I would love to be in Moscow in person, but it is also really nice to be here, at least online and virtually, because I really have a good memories connected with Stroka and with Moscow. And I would like to share some of the recent developments of this, you know, a relationship with this institution I have throughout the last couple of years. So it's a trailer, what I'm going to do today, a trailer, a sort of lecture trailer for my new book published at Strelka Press. The name of the uh, book is the same as the name of the lecture I'm going to do today, Introduction to Comparative Planetology. This lecture was, uh, I mean, this book was actually uh, launched last December, but uh, what I'm going to do today is not exactly that kind of lecture, which would be just an introduction to this topic as I usually do that, because I will try to use many or some Russian references to clarify what the book is about, to make it somehow, you know, more approachable also for the audience of this lecture. So I will start with a very specific Russian reference. Uh, and maybe you even know this story because uh, either for Russian history, the history of Russian literature, or from the wonderful analysis of this book by Mackenzie Borg in her book, Molecular Red. Uh, in 1908, uh, Alexander Bogdanov, who's the author of this story, uh, wrote a utopian science fiction novel. The name of this story, the name of this book is Red Star. The plot of the book presents a Russian revolutionary, a revolutionary man whose name is uh, Leonid. And this guy, Leonid, is tormented by the uneasy prospects of communist revolution, seeing many obstacles on the road to, the achieve, to achieve planetary society based on socialist values that Bogdanov was committed to back at the beginning of 20th century. One day, uh, Leonid, the main protagonist, is visited by many. Many is a Martian whose plan is to take Leonid to Mars. Leonid thus finds himself in the middle of an advanced alien society, and he discovers how communist principles envisioned in Marxist writings are embodied in the collectivist Martian society. Uh, the Martians explain Leonid throughout his visit on Mars, also how the conditions on the planet determine the type of society they have. Compared to the Earth, Mars is a small planet, and its land mass is not fragmented into several continents by a large bodies of water. According to Martians, that allowed for a great reunification of the Martian society. And another great unificatory element was the construction of the large planetary infrastructures, the canals for water and irrigation. To achieve these glorious edifices on Mars, the inhabitants of the Mars were in an urgent need for a kind of cooperation which would transcend their local communities. Earth, however, is according to Bogdanov's Martians quite complicated. Fragmented nation states cannot be unified under the banner of a common cause on this planet. And that also is determined by the way how the planet itself, the Earth, is diverse and, div and also divided many times. So Leonid finds a kind of bitter fate of the revolutionary pursuits of the earthly communists. The road to the socialist future on the blue planet is somehow lengthy and agonistic. So Bogdanov's story is an exercise in a comparative planetology. Uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, another sci-fi author, not from the history, but a contemporary American sci-fi author, characterized this kind of genre, this comparative planetology, as an actual science. And actually, it, it is a kind of empirical science that compares different celestial bodies in terms of the composition of their atmosphere or soil, uh, 
in terms of the geological and geophysical processes, and so on and so on. And in, in my account, comparative planetology becomes a philosophical genre, not an exact empirical science. It studies different visual and different philosophical cultures of imagining our planet, the Earth. What is important? Comparative planetology maps these cultures and these imaginations into a geopolitical realm because different imaginations of the planet reflect different geopolitical arrangements. These geopolitical spaces are then crucially translated into different geophysical and biochemical realities on the planetary scale. Take an example of uh, climate crisis. As recently noted by a philosopher Bruno Latour in his manifesto called Down to Earth, today it becomes abundantly clear that um, climate crisis is not simply a political problem because it is properly speaking a geopolitical affair since it transcends nation state boundaries both in its causes and in its effects. The chemical composition of the atmosphere of our planet is thus related to the geopolitical reality of fragmented nation states that are unable of cooperation. Perhaps we need, for this reason, a healthy dose of Martian communism now in order to develop most of the planetary cooperation we need. And in this triangular oscillation between imagination of our planet and its geopolitical as well as geochemical mappings, comparative planetology question. For example, for what Earth do we design? Or what geopolitical tendencies our imagination of Earth actually endorses? By doing so, comparative planetology contributes to an emergence of solid theoretical conceptualization of the planet in contemporary thinking about politics, media, design, or architecture. Because we increasingly refer to these terms like planetary entanglements, planetary conditions, planetary assemblages, planetary ecosystems, planetary scale computation, planetary megacities, and so on. But when we closely scrutinize these terms, we discover how these rhetorical gestures might in some cases turn out to be vacuous, especially when they turn into common currency in our intellectual cultures. So here the task of philosophy is to elaborate on the conceptual underpinnings of this emerging discourse of the planetary. However, why turn the question of what the planet means today into the kind of philosophical problem? Why is philosophy important here at all? Uh, there is a specific Czech way how to answer this question, again, Eastern European, based on an observation of Czech philosopher Jan Patočka, who claimed that the problem of philosophy is the world as a wall. And it is exactly this thinking about the world as a whole that in the situation of climate emergency turns out into uh, an inquiry into the conditions of our planetary existence. So this means that today, the world as a whole is the planet. And that brings me also to the clarification of what comparative planetology actually compares. Different visual and different philosophical imaginations of the planet are in comparative planetology clustered into some coherent figures. These figures are five. The planetary, the globe, the terrestrial, earthy taudas, and spectral Earth. So each of these figures represent a coherent cosmogram, if you will, as well as a kind of design brief and a geopolitical regime, and also a visual paradigm. And I would like to pronounce the cosmological aspect of comparative planetology here, because it is an exercise in identifying the basic elements, layers, and relations applied to a particular object of study, the planet. Now, in the rest of this teaser lecture, I will clarify these figures of comparative planetology by highlighting one or two key moments of each of these planetary imaginations. And then I will also say something more about the last figure, the spectral Earth, and I will conclude with this figure, my talk. So, the central figure, the central figure of comparative planetology is that of the planetary. It is an imagination of uh, Earth as an impersonal geophysical process in which humans play the role of temporary mediators. This figure of the planet emerges from our confrontation with the visuality of climate emergency. Because these planetary flows and forces that we are confronted with visually inscribe into the surface and the atmosphere of the planet the violence done to them. However, 
In this lecture, I will focus on the planetary mainly as a philosophical concept. It can be approached from two perspectives. The first perspective is Earth system perspective, and the other is critical subjective perspective. Earth system perspective looks at the planet as a process where inorganic objects, biological species, as well as geographical territories are treated equally as media for torrential forces that pack and unpack themselves with various chaos. We can clarify this by using this reference of um, contemporary philosopher William Connolly, who remarks in relation to the human position in these cascades of complex adaptive systems that we are inhabited or perhaps even better occupied by the forces of the world, rather than being the primary subjects and masters of these forces. So as humans, we are very delicate and very ephemeral assemblages, just as the Earth itself seen from the vantage point of cosmic history. And this understanding of the human as a temporary medium brings me to the second perspective, which is the critical subjective perspective on the planetary. This perspective is best represented by work of philosopher Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak. In her reading, the planetary brings gestures of disenchantment and also of the defamiliarization of the home. While Connolly talks about humanity inhabited by forces of the world, Spivak thinks about the planetary as an alterity, as something which is genuinely outside of the human. As she says, if we imagine ourselves as planetary accidents rather than global agents, as planetary creatures rather than global entities, alterity remains something underived from us. It is not our dialectical negation. It contains us as much as it flings us away. One can spot here the existence of alterity as something that I would call exteriority. And this idea of exterior, of something outside, of exteriority, is crucial to understand the argument of comparative planetology. This alterity slash exteriority, this alterity slash exteriority manifests itself as a procedure of the unfolding of path dependencies that were here before humans and that can very well continue also as, un, after the end of our species on the planet. The motto of this approach to the planetary is the following one. The planetary is hidden in every grain of sand. If you stand at any place on the planet, you can just look around within your surroundings and as a garden within a garden, you can unpack the complexity of the relations which are flowing through the particular place at the particular moment in time. From that observation, you can trace relations that far exceed any given site of observation. And we can take a very specific example, again, a Russian example. The temperatures in Siberia reaching beyond 40 degrees Celsius are the scariest news of the year, probably, much more than coronavirus, because they announce a collapse of a fragile but completely indispensable ecosystem, which is based on permafrost. So imagine you sit on a balcony in a city of Norilsk. You see the plants or buildings around you, the dust particles that gently fail on, the, on them have probably come from materials that traveled hundreds of thousands of kilometers. Some of them originated from the liquefied paths of the earth in the form of fossil fuels. Some other carbohydrates are spilled nearby in the recent Norilsk oil spill. The unusually warm weather that accompanies this situation is caused by an ongoing temperature anomaly. This anomaly, however, threatens far more than Siberian permafrost or the city of Norilsk because it is a planetary event with planetary consequences. And with, it, with this idea of the planetary as a form of metabolic exteriority, so with this idea in mind, we can explore now the second figure of comparative planetology, that of the globe. The globe is defined as a juxtaposition to the planetary. It provides a conceptual genealogy of Westphalian geopolitics of nation states, geopolitics based on discrete units, of nation states and presents a provisional history of some Western misconceptions about the planet driven by the colonial expansion of European countries from early modernity onwards. So it is no surprise that the history of the globe is associated with something that some thinkers such as Argentinian thinker Walter Mignolo call a darker side of Western modernity. And this darker side of Western modernity is coloniality and colonialism. The first key trait of the figure of the globe is the imagination of the world as a smooth, divisible terrain. The birth of this approach, of this figure of the globe, can be associated with some early cartographic gestures of modernity. One of them was an intervention of a 
the Pope Alexander VI in 1493. Uh, he, the Pope, as a speaker on behalf of an almighty observer of the world from above, which was the God, he resolved these territorial disputes between two early colonial powers, Portugal and Spain, by drawing an artificial line on the surface of the earth. The planet, thanks to the gesture of the Pope, was divided into two hemispheres. One was belonging to Portugal and the other to Spain. And what begins with the gesture of one Pope ends with global logistical networks. The construction of the omnidirectional smooth space is closely associated with sea transport and the open seascape becomes the spatial template of logistical modernity. This thing, container, becomes the tool of the spatial abstraction. It is a kind of geometrical metaphor for standardization of the commodity flows. And together with the emergence of smooth space, the second constitutive movement of the globe is the imagination of the world as something which is an interior, as observed, for example, by philosopher Peter Sloterdijk. It can be well illustrated on architectural and popular fascination with spheres or in Adam Smith's parables about the market as a giant sheltered marketplace. This idea of the world interior, the interiority of the world, secures also space for cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism and for interiorization of nature and culture. So in relation to climate emergency, Sloterdijk shows how the metaphor of the world as an interior finds its ultimate realization in the overheated hothouse of modernity. For this reason, modernity appears to be a great march of interiorization that consumes the planetary reality in human affairs. Hence, while the planetary stands for the figure of exteriority and alterity, the globe is a colonial imagination of the world as a unified, homogeneous wall. It is a figure of interiority. And this dichotomy This dichotomy is then invited by the third figure of comparative planetology that attempts to bring solutions to the integral failures of the globe. And this is the figure of the terrestrial. Since the end of the Cold War, the universalist ideas carried by the figure of the globe have been substantially questioned by many political approaches. Those older than me can surely remember anti-globalist protests culminating at the turn of the millennium with the Battle for Seattle or marches against the meeting of the International Monetary Fund in Prague. So since then, this kind of anti-globalist agenda has run out of the steam on the popular left and it has become the banner of post-fascism and the far right. There are, of course, also progressive localist responses to the globe, such as Bruno Latour's understanding of the terrestrial but for the sake of the brevity, I will focus only on the far right here. So a perfect example is an appeal to geopolitical multipolarization in thinking of Alexander Dugin and his right-wing interpretation of Russian Eurasianism. The Atlantic model of the globe, the model of naval empire, or if you will, the model of eternal Carthage, is juxtaposing Dugin's thinking by the Eurasian model the model of the eternal Rome, the empire of land grounded in local blood and soil. And so what is important in Dugin's theory, despite his repudiating political commitments and his very shallow eclecticism, is how his critique of the globe can somehow surprisingly align with those critiques of modernity and those critiques of the idea of the globe that we can find, for example, in Latour or in Sloterdijk. My suggestion here is that both the relocalizing tendencies and the late modernist revivals of the globalism are actually different versions of the same appeal to, in, to interiority, to the space of interiority. That is the space that we can be intimately familiar with and that can be unified or divided without any friction. An interiority in this case is understood as a space of natures, uh, sorry, as a space of cultures or of nations, nation states, not natures, but the opposite cultures, societies, nation states, and so on, political entities, and so on. Some exceptions from this appeal to interiority that we can find in contemporary thinking are, for example, aforementioned, uh, already mentioned Gayatri Spivak or another contemporary thinker, Benjamin Breton.
And now what I am really interested in is how to build not just politics, but also geopolitics around the principle of exteriority and the principle of authority that is around something we cannot be intimately familiar with. Such an approach would transcend both the localism of the terrestrial and the false universalism of the globe. Because it is interiority which leads to the possibility of segmentation and mastery of territories, and thus ultimately the impasse of the duality between the global and the local, and to the pathologies related to these dual categories. Exteriority raises some unsurpassable obstacles to this kind of attitude towards the world we inhabit. The question then is, what kind of planetary imagination can reverse all these interior, interiorizing tendencies of modernity, that is, tendencies that result either in colonial globality or in fragmented terrestriality? Can the principle of exteriority bring a promise of some kind of non-modern geopolitics? Well, my suggestion is to begin this exploration with some new figures of the planet. And for this reason, comparative planetology proposes two such figures. The first of them instructs to think about the planet as existing always and fundamentally without us. That is the figure of the Earth without us. And this figure, this figure of the Earth without us, is the figure of the radically indifferent Earth. This kind of monster Earth is best described by Gayatri Spivak when she claims that the planet gives a damn, that it is in the rules of the galaxy and the planetary system, and that we cannot touch it. The Earth without us is just some kind of dark, creative, but non-organic and inhuman Earth. We humans are just temporary symptoms of its deep geological and evolutionary processes. And in this sense, Earth without us is a kind of radical conclusion of the figure of the planetary that we have encountered earlier. If there is one distinguishing trait of the Earth without us, it is probably its deep complicity with geological time. It is the time of tectonic plates and, its, and their movement. It is the time of geological sedimentation. It is the time of the weathering of mountains. And it is also the time in which the climate change happens. Geological time consists in two constitutive moments. On the one hand, there is ancestrality. And on the other, there is posteriority. Consider now a following statement. Trilobites were species of mar marine organisms that disappeared 252 million years ago. This statement uh, talks about realities preceding the emergence of humans, and it is a French philosopher, Cantal Meyazou, who calls such statements ancestral. What is important about ancestrality is that it precedes, properly speaking, not just an emergence of humans, but an emergence of thinking itself. These ancestral realities are anterior to their givenness to humans, or in other words, they are fundamentally misaligned with human thinking. A similar statement seems to be also the following one. In five billion years, the sun will turn into a red giant, and it will consume the planet Earth. This statement provides a knowledge of a time after our own extinction. That means after the end of thinking. And the statement thus reveals the mirror concept of ancestrality, which is posteriority. Posteriority can be traced back to Jean-Francois Lyotard's notes on solar death, rehearsed also by a contemporary philosopher, Ray Brassier. Hence, we can have a knowledge of events preceding the emergence of humans, and we can also think about those events that will come after our extinction. And with these notes about extinction, let me unpack the last figure of comparative planetology, which is spectral Earth. This figure of the planet represents a shadow realm populated by the spectres of extinct species. Spectral Earth is neither a world to win nor to save. It is a world to be mourned. Environmental mourning as a cultural technique and as a collective practice, is tied to the truth of the sixth mass extinction and not only to it. Because as natural sciences tell us, 
every known biological species comes with its expiration date. And Homo sapiens is no, expe no, no exception in this. The problem is does not that much whether we will become extinct, but how we will cope with the truth of that extinction and subsequently how we will design for extinction. Some authors believe that we are already living our own time of extinction. One of them is Marina Garces, contemporary Spanish philosopher. Rather than speaking about some kind of post-humanism or post-human condition, she prefers to talk about post-humus condition, conditio post-huma. A post-humus situation is the one that we might very well live in already now. And it can be assessed by some people, perhaps as a reason for pessimism or defeatism. Yet it would be misleading. It would be misleading since there is no reason to associate human centrality and importance in the planetary assemblage with hope and optimism, or the decentering of the human with nostalgia, melancholy, and defeat. On contrary, conditio postuma carries the possibility of living with the truth of extinction, that is living with the specter of the future death of the species. This figure, the figure of spectral Earth, thus allows us to see ourselves as ephemeral elements of planetary metabolism, arriving at a variation of what is by some thinkers called an outside view on ourselves. And this kind of outside view on ourselves is central to the geopolitics of the 21st century. It brings a moment of productive alienation, an alienation when we see our own image, but we cannot recognize ourselves in it, as Benjamin Bratton would say. Yena Sutala's lyrics for Holly Herndon's track Extreme Love from her latest album Proto gain an utmost importance here. She says that we are completely outside ourselves and the world is completely inside us. And while writing the introduction to comparative planetology, I prefer to think about the first half of the quotation as the central one. But with the coronavirus traveling to the bodies of so many fellow humans around the planet, the second half seems to be suddenly more relevant. And the question then is, where to situate individual political agency in this landscape of impersonal torrential forces? I believe there are ways to adapt our agency to those many new normals of our era, be it pandemics or, cl or climate emergency. The notion of subjectivity and agency I seek is one that would be more faithful to classification of the human species as political animals. That's the kind of classification that comes from Aristotle's philosophy. In Greek, it would be, uh, it would mean zoon politikon, that's political animals. And this approach would underscore some kind of human animality, as recently also argued by an important Finnish artist whose name is Terike Hapoya, and thus working towards an understanding of the political from this point of reference, from the point of reference when we see humanity as some kind of animality. The central idea here is the idea of limit and the idea of self-limitation. And this idea is based on exercising freedom by posing limits to ourselves, as well as by understanding these limits and maneuvering between these limits. And finally, also by elaborating on these limits towards some new modes of collective existence. In post-communist Eastern European context, limits and self-limitation are taken as an extremely hostile idea, given the history of freedom and democracy in this region. For this reason, it is twice as important to pronounce that the liberal idea of freedom, the idea we have been pursuing for the last 30 years, maybe in the wake of the ecological collapse replaced with a more complex and more nuanced notion of political agency. Take this example. By wearing a face mask, you publicly announce that the conditions of your existence do not end at the tip of your nose. This gesture is the acknowledgement that we all are still primarily kind of interrelated inter intensities of biological mass, not some invincible members of the metaphysical landing party powered by an ethereal substance called freedom. We are just another species of political animals in the wild. We are vulnerable vectors of alien particles, and that is where the notion of political agency can be fostered in how we bond or how we withdraw from bondage 
in order to elaborate on our own limits and in order to continually update our agency on an ever-changing cosmic background of reality. So to wrap up, let me elaborate on a few concluding remarks. The figure of spectral Earth also feeds back into the previous figures of the Earth lethal dust and the planetary. So to explain, the planetary is a root or the base for a new imagination. And both Earth lethal dust and spectral Earth are the continuations or some kind of radicalizations of the original proposition to view the planet as an indifferent process. So instead of governing the landscape, we arrive at the possibility a kind of possibility of becoming a kind of landscape. Camouflage together with dislocation and decentralization rather than hypervisibility might be a better guiding principles in this pursuit. This reality of spectral earth seems to be embodied also in some recent cultural artifacts. A few months ago, my colleague Leonardo de la Noche, who you might know as one of the organizers of the Digital Earth Fellowship, made me aware of some surprising similarities between the figure of the spectral Earth and Hideo Kojima's PS4 game named Death Stranding. So playing for the main protagonist of the game, you are repeatedly confronted with the ghosts of extinct species, which appear in our reality thanks to a mysterious, mysterious event that, connect, that connected the world of the living with the world of the dead. The ghosts almost seem to be some kind of mediators between the planetary and the individual. The haunting that happens in the game is not there just to scare you. It also bursts information about the positioning of your individual human existence within this giant mesh of planetary flows and forces. So instead of being ruling the landscape, we are exposed in the spirit of philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche as the most unfortunate, most delicate, and most transitory beings. The ghost is then a necessary navigational tool, a companion that can guide you through a precarious landscape. And thinking about the climate emergency and present as well as possible future pandemic situations, this is a type of landscape we all inhabit now by default. This perspective brings a certain sense of hardship because suddenly cutting through the material of history becomes really hard because it becomes really slow, it gets really sticky, it gets really problematic. And this sentiment might also induce some sense of kinship, because in the game, players help each other to move through the problematic terrain, leaving traces and signs, many types of, for example, energy generators and so on, because they know how difficult it is to get through all the obstacles in the game and all the goals that you encounter there. And these are moments of solidarity in the game, moments in which the possibility of kinship is experienced. And if there is one, the medium of kinship is not institutions as we know them, but infrastructures. Infrastructural politics begins the moment when you build material networks and logistical systems. We tend to think about logistics as something which is related to the regime of the globe, the regime of globalization and logistical modernity, but the open question, and the question that is actually partly answered by Kojima's game, is how we can imagine infrastructural politics that would be post-capitalist, and also properly speaking, post-anthropocenic. Much of it has to do with understanding infrastructures as parts of the metabolic nexus of chemical elements, and in general as parts of what we would refer to in old-fashioned vocabulary as nature. Infrastructures are a vehicle of a continuation of these natural flows and their artificial, artificiality here can be legitimately contested since they fully partake in the realm of the planetary. The infrastructural politics then becomes also a kind of ecological politics and we can go much further. Kojima's game envisions an alliance of united cities across North America that replace former federal state structures in this post-apocalyptic world. And this idea is also extremely relevant here because it enacts some kind of post-apocalyptic and technologically, me technologically mediated municipal federalism, the federalism of cities. And the city to come is the city as infrastructure. And ultimately, we might begin to read the planet itself as a kind of infrastructural space where logistics are fully integrated into larger planetary metabolisms, entering the stage of geological time. So cities 
are infrastructural spaces, yes, but also potential geopolitical actors. They are giant metabolic chains, machines that direct our behavior and thinking. They are massive ecologies of things and bodies. And this understanding erases the distinction between the city and the forest, rendering the city a continuation of the forest by other means. As recently implied by research of Polo Tavares and forensic architecture, we have always been constructing nature, and nature has been always constructing us. The city is just a, a kind of intermediary form of this general transformative feedback loop. Does the city's current dense form, which is highly distinguished from the surrounding landscape, does not have to be its future mode of existence? Instead, let us think about cities as landscapes. And such a perspective is no strange to the history of Soviet architecture. In the 60s, the group of young architects known as NER, the element of settlement, the new element of settlement is the name of this group in English, came up with an idea to think about the city as a river. Their vision was extremely infrastructural and extremely metabolic, and it hinted towards these utopian projects of municipal federalisms. The centrality of the city as a basic unit of the infra infrastructural geopolitics leads also today to the understanding of municipal politics, politics on the levels of the cities, for example, in Moscow or any other Russian city, as of the practice of co-curating of planetary flows and ecologies. That is a practice which always exists in a larger geopolitical framing. The local, in this perspective, is no longer an opposite of the global. It is just a clumsy term, this term local. It is a clumsy term to express how our immediate surroundings can be treated as an index of the metabolic process of the planetary. And hence, what comparative paleontology in the end wants to bring is a certain framework of situatedness, not just the framework of the planetary, but also ways how to understand our particular situations at our immediate surroundings. And that is all from my side what I wanted to say today in the lecture, and I, be, I will be looking forward for uh, the Q&A session now. Thank you. Lukas, thank you so much for the lecture. Uh, it was great and uh, very interesting. Um, so starting with the uh, questions, I would like to start with one from myself. Uh, I have your book right here and uh, on page uh, 205, uh, you're speaking about the cities uh, and the city's current dense form, highly distinguished from the surrounding landscape, doesn't have to be its future mode of existence. Uh, how do you imagine the future of our cities then? Thank you. That's a really good question. And that's actually something that directly elaborates on so also on the end, on this ending of this conclusion of the lecture. Because, um, well, when I was in Russia last year, I stumbled upon an architect whose name was uh, Lazar Markovich Kidekel. He's, uh, I think, a suprematist architect, like from early, early 20th century. And he was drawing this, uh, this, uh, this kind of like, he was this kind of like speculative architect that was doing these kinds of drawings. Very, some of them were called uh, erosity, and these uh, these kind of erosities were usually a kind of like really you know distinguished modernist uh, modernist uh, buildings that are some kind of like mega blocks or something like that, uh, or some kind of like large mega structures. And and I think that uh, this is the kind of uh, imagination that already leads towards the answer on your question, but it's not exactly that because it remains still too modernist in a way. And this kind of like modernism that I'm kind of uh, trying to attack also in the book through this uh, kind of uh, notion of modernity as something which is committed to interiority, as something which is committed to the inside and committed also to the idea of globe in this sense, also brings then a very different uh, kind of template for an architectural thinking. Because I imagine it more as a situation in which actually what we build is no longer interiors, but rather landscapes. It might be kind of trivial in this way, but I think when we, for example, think about landscape architecture in general, and also uh, how it's somehow this kind of discipline is treated as uh, too broad, Maybe it is not in the end too broad landscape architecture, but it is the best description of what architecture should be in the end. And so this is a kind of uh, 
this is the kind of uh, answer that would probably stick to some you know practices that we have already now thinking more about inhabit you know uh creating spaces of inhabitation as something which is related to creating exteriors creating landscapes and thinking about landscape as the primary habitat uh, we all experience now through uh the situation of the quarantine how limited the interiority is how limited it is to be locked in one room as for example in my flat i have a single room flat and that meant that i was like for two months almost continuously in one room and i mean this is like this i felt like literally like being in a container or something like that and uh there are ways how to think about architecture as curating of networks or as curating of these exteriors more as something that creates these containerizations that also for example peter sloterdijk is uh, attacking in his work and so yeah the trivial answer is the answer is landscape architecture the more difficult answer is that there should be modes of architectural practice which are less about maybe even building new things but curating what already exists and reassembling things that already are at our hands or at our disposal Mm -hmm. Thank you. You've touched upon the concepts of global and local exteriority and mm -hmm. interiority. And in the beginning, you were using this uh, four quadrant map in your presentation earlier. Uh, what do you think about uh, the pandemic? Did it change our understanding of these notions? Uh, will there be any different understanding of locality now? Will there be an increase uh, in importance of it? Or does this does not change our perception at all? Of locality? Yes. Yeah, I think it would uh, uh, be a mistake to call it locality. I think what is more important is to think about it as situatedness. And this framework of situatedness that I was thinking at the end is, in the end, what should happen after comparative planetology? What should happen after comparative planetology is, uh, creating not just the framework of the planetary, but also the framework of the situatedness. And so uh, what I'm doing when you uh, mention this four quadrant um, diagram, is that actually, if you look into this exteriority side, for me, that's the escape path, the escape path out of this world diagram, yeah, somewhere else. So exterior is something like a gate somewhere else, yeah? And this kind of gate is something that leads to a uh, a perspective where the planetary and the local is not juxtaposition. The local is rather, as I said at the end, a clumsy term, but a clumsy term for what? Is a clumsy term that expresses a kind of like fractal relation when something which you can unwind the local and you realize that if you look inside any locality, you will find a complexity of relations which are analogous to the world planetary situation. So that's why I use this metaphor of the garden within the garden at one point. It's a metaphor which is very old. It comes actually from uh, an early modern thinker whose name is uh, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. And Leibniz was thinking about ways how to understand relations between different elements in a way that wouldn't be just some kind of, you know, uh, relation between two static entities, but as something that every single entity mirrors the rest of all the entities in some unique way. So this is the kind of situation that I want to imagine when, I when I'm talking about the planetary, the kind of situation that leads to this fractality, to, th to this idea that you can open the box of the locality and you will find the planetary, planetary again inside. Mm -hmm, thank you. And I also wanted to ask about the figures that you are using for, uh, for like the concept of comparative planetology. Are the ones which um, you are using are the only ones which exist, or these are the figures which you use to speak about uh, on the notion of climate change? Do you think that any more figures can emerge in future? Yes, definitely. I hope so, because. Um, it's the similar. It's what the comparative paleontology as a philosophical genre is. Is that it's a kind of method in, in the end, kind of cosmological methodology. It doesn't bring some finite number of possible imaginations, but the the the, the real point is to grasp the method, not the content that much, because someone can use this method and arrive at a very different conclusion. And I think that some people intuitively did that in the past, or they are doing that in the present. I think that one of the work that I'm usually citing, not just, not just in the book, but also in the lecture now, was the work of Bruno Latour, 
And he has this lecture who's called uh, Tale of Seven Planets. You can find that on YouTube, that lecture. And it's a lecture where he's doing his own exercise in comparative, comparative paleontology, and he uses different concepts and different figures. I think what is important in comparative paleontology is really to grasp this method, and then you can go far beyond the limits of one particular mind using this for some kind of their philosophical endeavors and using the comparative paleontology rather as a way how to actually, you know, multiply our imagination in a way which actually leads to some positive indexing of these different, you know, situa si situations, like the situations, I mean, particular localities, yeah. So uh, that's that's what is important for me in comparative paleontology, I think. And that is also why I think that uh, the answer to the question whether there can be more figures must be enthusiastically positive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, also, there is a question about own, uh, your concept of ownership and usership. Uh, so wow. you're uh, speaking about, uh, in the book, I think, uh, about uh, how we can switch from ownership into usership. And what are the terms under which we can uh, achieve this? Is it possible today or in some nearest future uh, when everyone are so different in their, um, in their situations? Yeah, okay. Uh, the story of this um, uh, transition from... Uh, ownership to usership is a story that begins, I think, with uh, the first female laureate uh, nominee for the Nobel Prize in Economics. Her name was uh, and is Eleanor Ostrom. Eleanor Ostrom is an economist who brought this idea of uh, uh, usership as something that can replace ownership based on her study of different uh, non-Western cultures that were using different modes of how to treat their uh, their particular um, their particular land, for example. For example, you have a rice field, and when the rice field is flooded during a session uh, during during a season when there is a lot of rain, what happens is that it is uh, under the water, and suddenly it doesn't make sense. For example, to have this field segmented into a kind of you know uh, some kind of rectangle, for example, that would be a geometrical you know enclosure of that that would that would lead to some kind of thinking about that particular plot as something that belongs to one particular person. It becomes more like a common resource suddenly. For example, for fishermen who are on their boats on this river catching fishes while the rice field is under the water. And Ostrom then realized that in the end, what is important is really that what is the mode of the way how we use that particular thing, not how we own that thing. Because the owner doesn't necessarily have to have all the, the ownership is something that defines some kind of relation to that particular land, for example, but it doesn't, strictly speaking, says about what is the regime of the access to that resource. So it is. So I think that usership is about changing our perspective on what is the what is the condition of access of some resource. And if you think, for example, about one particular resource, which is very important at the moment, and that's carbon sinks, the capacity of the earth to uh, somehow uh, digest or consume the existing carbon, which is in the atmosphere. These carbon sinks are also this kind of what Eleanor Ostrom would say, common pool resource. And these resources are something which have to be managed in a way which is kind of collective, because you cannot uh, exclude someone from this resource in a way which would somehow prevent that person from accessing it again. These carbon sinks are something that we all need, actually, in that way that uh, the carrying capacity of the environment, of the planet, is, is limited. And this kind of uh, capacity is also expressed in this kind of carbon sink sometimes, partially. And these carbon sinks are also, in this sense, this kind of common pool resource that uh, if we, is, uh, you know, treat it the, the, if the access to the resource is treated unjustly, it actually results in the you know continuation of old violences, colonial violences, for example, because we see that, for example, how much carbon is uh, emitted into the atmosphere by uh, one uh, person, for example, living in Czech Republic or in uh, some center or in Moscow or in East or in uh, I don't know Western Europe, some country of Western Europe is very different, for example, from the carbon or the amount of carbon which is emitted by activity of someone who, for example, lives in, I don't know, India or who lives, for example, in Oceania, in those island countries that are most affected uh, by the climate change at the moment.
So uh, the idea of the usership then also, uh, so the way how to actually manage these common pool resources then needs global infrastructures that in a just manner share the access to these resources. And this kind of relation to these resources can be then, uh, you know, called usership rather than as ownership of these resources because no one can own this kind of ecosystem services. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, there is also a question from one of our listeners who was wondering about the dangers of such an unbound understanding of design uh, slash architecture. Can you elaborate on the elevated role of the designer and the uneven relationship of power that is fortified? That's a really good question because I think this, this is something that frequently comes to the mind of uh, um people listening to uh scholars or academics or also designers that are somehow that somehow went through the training in speculative re uh, in speculative design and that ended also in a sort of extending of this notion of design far beyond its its, uh, its uh, original original meaning so uh i think i would rely in this answer on uh thinking of benjamin bratton in the end because in the stack he defines design through etymology through the etymology the etymology of design as designation and this kind of designation of uh, determining is actually a practice that doesn't bring that much unbound creativity as rather some constraining of this practice in that way that you are working with the existing material that is something that you are somehow creatively bringing into the world it's not about bringing new things into the world, but rather about already curating what exists here in a manner which can be uh, sustainable. Let's, let's, let's use the word sustainability, because if there's something important also in this relation of the design to sustainability, then that's also uh, the way how sustainability is intimately connected to different temporal scales. Because when you think about sustainability as it is defined, it is a kind of concept that brings into consideration the well-being of future generations. And that's also a scope of design, which is actually interesting to uh, to work with, because the, perhaps the, those plans that we need or those projects that we need are projects that actually work on the, work on the temporal scale that is not uh, associated with the usual genre of design or architecture, but still, I think that this is not that much extension of the no of notion of design or broadening of the notion of design, but bringing some new coordinates into like what is that kind of uh, activity that the design is. So in the end, I think that it is rather redefining than broadening the notion of design that happens also in my thinking. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we have the last question, which um, is about Patrick's Geddes intro, uh, Patrick's Geddes concept of region to architecture and planning. Uh, he coined a term con conurbation. Uh, by any means, as that means that we should rethink this idea. I think the idea of regional architect, the idea of, of the region. Yes. Because the idea of region, where, so what is the region? Is the region something that is defined based on uh, the consensus between some parties that agree that this will be the borders of the region? Or is it something that respects some bioregional boundaries, for example? I think that's the first uh, question we have to ask in this, because um, if we want to th th rethink regionality, I think what is important in this to really bring back this topic, which is frequently used in the environmental thinking and that's the topic of bioregionalism and by bioregionalism for example in the last year of the new normal at Sroka institute there was a wonderful project which was called mera which was about bioregional jurisdiction of the caspian sea and that's for example a kind of project that aligns existing jurisdiction with um with uh with a real geography with real geography geology biochemistry of the given part of the world because if you for example think about an example not from russia but from the us mississippi river latour also uses this example quite often mississippi river is a, a kind of river that has some kind of like nature bioregion around it it is not something that uh, it's not something that is uh, can be you know easily divided into this kind of uh, into this kind of plots on the map 
some kind of cartographic cart cartographical gestures of this kind. But in, in fact, this kind of this kind of river, and I think any river in the end is uh, is uh, has some kind of like natural region around it. And that's perhaps more important than dividing. For example, in Europe, we have Danube, which is a long river that goes through Germany, then Austria, Slovakia, Hungary, and so on. And in in the end, what is important, for example, for the management of, if I say it a bit uh, in an anthrop anthropomorphic manner, well-being of that river. Uh, so the best way how to manage it is probably to actually manage it in its all you know length that river and to think about the environment of the river in its totality not divide it into these you know sectors which are given by the different nation states through which that river flows so uh in this sense this kind of like political or this kind of a geopolitical arrangement is parasitic on some arrangement which predates this uh, geopolitical arrangement and that can inform the way how we can arrange our geopolitical jurisdictions better Lukas, thank you so much for your answers and thank you for the lecture. Thank you. Have a nice day or evening. Uh, thank you. Uh, this lecture will stay on YouTube and all Stroka social media platforms. Please follow us there and check out stroka.com for more events. Thank you everybody for watching us today. Bye.